So I uh, I am super excited to to have the opportunity to engage with you. You should know that I am, as always in this kind of events, the oddball here because very much like Derek, I am not um, a physician, but I also don't have any physician in my family. So I really learned about healthcare as as an outsider, and I had questions. I had questions about what I was observing. So today I'm going to share some of my thoughts. Um, of course, I only have a short period of time to do it, and we're going to scratch the surface. So what I want to share with you is some high-level thoughts. Uh, of course, if you want to engage with me and have additional conversations about this, um, you can find me, uh, and I will talk about this as long as you will, and those of you that know me have experienced that. So uh, let's get right into that. So there we go. So what when we think about alignment, we have to think about what are we aligning with, right? What, whose goals are we aligning uh, our behaviors to? Alignment means, you know, working in a way that we can all drive in the same direction. And we have to have a direction. So what I have observed, again, as an outsider, is that there are certain um, problems, I would say, certain uh, suboptimal type of dynamics in the um, healthcare industry, at least for my observations in the United States, but not on, only in the United States. I've seen similar things in other markets as well. And if we think about the relationships between these four players, four key players in the healthcare, uh, let's call it ecosystem, uh, we have contractual relationships among these players. So what I will not um, talk about tonight, just because we don't have a lot of time, is um, the direct contractual relationship between the physician and the payer. So if, if you are a standalone practice, if you build uh, directly for your own, the, what I'm about to share may not apply directly to you, but there might be other versions of that. But when we think about the contractual relationships in the market, in the healthcare industry, we have separate contracts between separate entities. And these are the entities that we, uh, at least the, we have this the very basic set of these entities. And so there's a whole lot of contracts between these entities. Payers pay hospitals for you know, the technical uh, fees. Uh, payers pay physician, physician organizations or other entities that hire you. The physicians. So the physician organization pays you, uh, the, the physician's organization might pay the hospital. So there's a whole lot of contractual relationships between these entities. And due to the current situation with respect to payment models and practices that I have observed in, in, in healthcare, what we see is the result of the current situation is that the individual physician decisions, behaviors, and um, activities tend to be aligned to the goals of the payer. Because if we think about very simply fee-for-service, pays for volumes, pay for a specific type of procedures, it trickles down to an RVU-based or a volume-based compensation for you guys, which means that you are working in the interest of the goals of the payer. And that is one of the biggest questions I had, like, how is that right? And so what I want to propose to you is that instead, Every one of these of these entities have their own strategic goals and can therefore drive alignment within their organizations in order to align the behaviors, the decisions, the effort, the uh, skills, and the activities of the people that work for them uh, toward the goal that they set for themselves. So there is no need um, to align across contracts. Every entity is uh, the own or should be the owner of their own strategic goals. And yes, there are regulatory barriers, for sure. There are restrictions, but they're not so stringent as many people think. Actually, recently with the 2021 revision of the anti-kickback um, uh, provisions, there have been several um, relaxations of the, of the constraints that were once there. So I would encourage people to explore this space and see what can be done to align the, um, the behaviors of the people that work in the organization to the goals of the organization. Now, what does that mean? It means that we need to start, this slide should be read from the right back to the left. So following the red arrow that says reverse engineering. My um, opinion, my, my stance is that healthcare institutions need to regain ownership of their own strategic goals. I feel that there's an opportunity to do that much more and much more intentionally. 
And may, many of you probably don't need to do better than they already are. But generally, based on my conversations, I believe there's room for improvement there. So if we think about, okay, the concept of value that Dr. Warner uh, mentioned in terms of value-based healthcare, um, it needs to be defined at the individual institution level. What does it mean to deliver value in your institution? And the, delivering value means to consider who your patients are, what is your patient population looking like, what services do you provide, what are the things that you can do for them, but also what do you do best? And then once you have defined what the value is and the strategic goal to deliver the best value, the, the maximum value that you can deliver, then you have to understand what drives that value and reverse engineer those activities and behaviors that drive value. Otherwise, the rest is, is, is not important. And those are the activities that need to be measured and rewarded. This is what we call alignment. Because now everybody is pulling in the right direction, everybody's pulling in the same direction, and everybody understands how their activities and behaviors and decisions and contributions deliver, contribute to deliver that organizational value. A lot of times I see organizations building from the left to the right. They acquire a bunch of uh, talent, they acquire a bunch of assets, they acquire a bunch of skills, and then they try to find ways of how they, how they can use it uh, in the best way possible. I really encourage you to do the opposite. Think about where do you want to be? What is the definition of value for your organization? And what do you need to do to deliver on that? So when we think about compensation, compensation is a very, very powerful uh, mechanism, much more powerful than we give it credit for. Um, there is a long history of research. This is not me. People that are much smarter and much more accomplished than I ever will have written for decades about the multitasking environment. This is a, an economic definition for the situation that we all find ourselves in. We have a lot of responsibilities, a lot of activities, a lot of targets, a lot of deliverables, and we only have a finite amount of time, effort, skills, uh, you know, um, ability to, to the capacity, if you will. Um, so when we uh, construct a compensation uh, model, we have to be very careful about what is it that we're communicating. In a multitasking environment, research shows that there are three tiebreakers. One, what is explicitly paid for? So if you paid for something, if you attach a compensation amount to a specific metric, that becomes in instantly more important than others that you're not paying explicitly for. The second tiebreaker is what is easier to measure? Because of course, if something is easier to measure, I can map my decisions, activities, and, and behaviors to that metric. I know how to move that metric. And so I can focus on things that I know how to make them better. The third is what I'm good at. So if I have all else equal, things that are paid for, that are easy to measure, then I'm going to default in what I'm actually good at. So when we think about uh, compensation uh, contracts, we have to think about what is it that we're sending. Are we sending mixed signals? Let's think about the canonical RVU-based comp compensation. That in and of itself says volumes are king. That's all we care about. If I pay you for RVUs, I care about volume. Now we can tell people all day long that we care about more than volume, but we're only paying for volume. And so this is what happens. The tiebreakers kick in. Volumes will be more important than all the other things that we say they are important. I want to point to this uh, book, which I have no credit for. Absolutely. This is a, a behavioral economist, one of my favorite authors. His name is Uri Nisi. And this book is very, very simple. And it really brings the point across. So if you have time this, you know, over the summer, I recommend the read. So when we think about uh, com compensation, we need to think about messaging. The construction of your compensation plan, it is indeed the strongest signal that you can provide about what priorities your entities is pursuing. Now, what does it mean to compensate? So how should we compensate people in order to align these priorities? So there's a continuum, and probably all of you that are in practice are paid with a construction that is somewhere on this continuum, probably not at the extremes, but some of you might. Let's start from the volume-based compensation, which is what we were just talking about. There are good things about volume-based compensation. I am not um, at all in favor of removing a volume component from compensation because we need 
to see a lot of patients. We need to uh, generate revenue. So the, the good things about uh, the volume-based compensation uh, style is that it gives the physician, the individual provider, control over their earnings. If I work more, I earn more. So I have a lever that I can use to, uh, to control the amount that I bring home. It's generally, generally aligned with revenue, at least in the current uh, system uh, in the United States. Because again, there's that connection between fee for service and and RVUs, and it is generally financially viable because what you get paid for uh, an RVU is generally less than what the revenue generated is. So generally, it it works. It doesn't lose money. Now, the downside of a, a volume based paid is that again, as we were just saying, it prioritizes volume. It becomes transactional. This is another aspect that's important. It becomes a very very um, stark exchange of things that you do for money that you get. And all those um, additional behaviors that you do, you know, all the little things that you do for your patients, for your hospital, for your colleagues, just fall in the background because of that tiebreaker structure that I just explained. And, and we know that because of the pressure on volumes, it is a strong driver of burnout and job dissatisfaction. And we know that that's a problem um, that's very pervasive in this industry. Okay, so one could say, let's go all the way to the other end and let's pay everybody a fixed salary so we don't have any of these problems. Okay, there are good things about fixed salaries. Earnings are very predictable. You know the number. The number is going to be the same no matter what you do. There's less stress on volume, so probably less burnout, less um, you know overwork. There's lower you know, mischievous in in incentives. There's not, the, you know, the moral injury of feeling like I have to produce more, but maybe this is not the, the right thing for the patient. It, there's none of that because it's a fixed salary. So there is no pressure to over-indicate or over-utilize. However, the fixed salary doesn't give you any clear priority because there is no metric that drives your compensation. And so it's really difficult then to align the behaviors using a fixed salary. The other thing that it could create is perceptions of unfairness. You might think that paying everybody the same amount could be fair, but it is not to the extent that somebody works harder than somebody else or somebody is better at their job than somebody else. So the meritocracy is not there. And a lot of times this type of structure is considered to be unfair. Um, and the other thing is that it might drive things that are of very little value, things that you like to do or somebody is good at, and they are not really aligned with the goals of the organization. Additionally, it's not just about the money. And I have striked out here um, the money and just put your money. And there's a reason for that, which, which I will explain in a second. Um, in one of the cases that we teach at Harvard Business School, there's a very famous case that was written by Professor Robert Simons. And it's the Mary Kay case. Mary Kay is not a healthcare company. That is a, actually a cosmetic company that used to sell cosmetics uh, over, over, um, over the mail. And what that, that company came up with was a very interesting combination of ways to motivate and uh, attract and retain the people that wanted to work in that organization. And so they came up with this acronym, STORM, which is very easy to remember. And by no means, this is an exhaustive list. So, but it brings the point across that there's more than money that motivates people, that makes people feel good about themselves and their work. For example, satisfaction, knowing that you're doing a good job, self-esteem, being recognized as an expert, as a good physician, teamwork, being part of a good team, of a winning team, a team that works well together, that delivers good outcomes, opportunities for development, for further education, for personal growth, for professional growth. Being said, you know, being said thank you every once in a while, recognition or gratitude. Of course, money, because of course we have to pay the bills. And um, that always is, uh, is a question. It, it, it is a motivator, uh, at least to some extent. I want to also mention that money, this is the reason why I struck out that the and used your money. Money, in, specifically in healthcare, I've seen tangible rewards being given also not to you as part of your paycheck, but in other forms. For example, making, um, uh, buying your time so that you can do other things like research or other things that might interest you or uh, assigning an extra budget um, amount to your department for some initiative that you uh, would like to pursue. So there are many ways to use money, not just in your paycheck. Now, here's the thing. If I, if I were to ask 
all of you to just tell me what you are motivated by. I think that we could guess the list pretty good, pretty well, right? We could come up with the list if we had to just say, these are things that generally motivate people. And this list that is on this slide is a good starting point. Again, not exhaustive, but a good starting point. Now, here's the work that I'm developing now, and I'm really excited about this. So I want to I want to put a little plug on that as well. These things are differently important for each of you. If you had to rank them, or if you had to decide what's more important than another among this list, you would probably have very different answers. So when we think about ways to motivate people to do their best work, we need to consider that individuals differ among, among themselves and across people to what is important to them and how important that is compared to other things. And also their preferences will evolve over time. Maybe, you know, right out, out of medical school, you have huge student debt, you're starting a family, of course, money is going to be super important. But maybe later in your career, you, you will find that something else is more motivating to you. So I think this is an exciting time to explore uh, these um, opportunities that we have to motivate people in many ways, constructing better compensation plans, but also using other levers that are, are at your disposal. And if you want to know about, more about what I'm doing on the, in this space, please feel free to reach out to me. I would always love to talk about this. So I'm going to stop here. Um, and I'm going to just thank uh, everybody for, the, for your attention and your time and thank the organizers for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you.